Yeah, it's tricky, especially when you're shooting a scene like this where we had one night, all of this work at a remote location, very far away from the city. So in this case, the torch is actually enough. It, it would have done, yeah, 95% of that scene. Hey, what is going on, Andy Mogul? My name is Ted. Today we're going over the film Invisible Man with the cinematographer here today. We have Stefan Ducio here. Today we're going to be talking about the film from the camera, the lighting, the lenses, and we're going to be breaking into a little bit of the cinematography into each scene. So, uh, Stefan, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. For sure. Thanks for coming out. First off, I want to jump into what was the actual visual style of the film? How did you guys find the way that it was going to look? Over weeks and weeks, Lee and I discovered that language. You know, he, he had a lot of notes next to his original script about wanting to have unmotivated camera movement, frames of emptiness, and questions about how we were going to make that suspenseful. Lee has a lot of experience in horror, so I trust him immensely on that side of things. He's got amazing taste in how to build suspense and horror and try and engage the cinematography more. The camera work can be so suggestive and so suspenseful and playful in a way. Lee said to me once that he wanted it to feel like the camera knew more about what was happening in the film than Cecilia did or that the audience did. For example, she might be doing something domestic like folding her clothes in the corner of her bedroom. You know, as a cinematographer, you know, you would normally frame the actor for that and keep the frame on the actor. What we wanted to do on this film was leave Cecilia at times and just land the camera in a corner of an empty room and just hold that corner of an empty room for an inordinately long time and, and have the audience go, why am I looking at that corner? Yeah. <laughs> and we felt that by doing that enough, that would create suspense and tension. It almost feels more suspenseful that we're watching characters that don't quite know what's going on. And again, that was another thing I really loved about his script is the restraint that it showed. As a reader, I kept thinking, okay, we're gonna see him on this page. Okay, we're gonna see him on this scene. Okay, we're gonna, he's gonna say something now. Or, And the fact that he leaves that so late in the film, I found way more suspenseful. And also made me question her sanity way more because I thought, oh, hang on, maybe none of this is happening. The idea that none of this may have been happening was something I was really keen to keep as part of the visual language of the film. You know, we watched uh, parts of Prisoners, Denis Villeneuve's film. We watched some of Personal Shopper. A lot of that film is about her as a medium wandering around, haunting empty spaces. A ghost story. Oh, um, so good. The Rooney Mara film I love. Again, because... Uh, a woman alone in this house and feeling the presence of someone else in there and the ability to hold shots for so long in that film I found really inspiring. Can you tell me a little bit about the camera and the lenses that were chosen for the film? Yeah, we shot on an Alexa LF uh, with a large format Alexa camera and that's a sensor that's bigger than a standard Alexa but not quite as big as the Alexa 65. It made the world feel bigger. It was a 4K capture, which I thought we should be capturing on. And it enables to use large format lenses, which I loved. We, we picked the, ultimately ended up picking Arri Signature Prime, which feel really modern, yet they've got a kind of smooth texture to it. They're not sharp and clinical. Uh, they still have a lot of character to them. And again, that term modern is quite scary for a lot of directors and cinematographers because a lot of people I work with anyway, including myself, have a great love for vintage lenses and film and a softer look. But again, like I was saying before about the visuals should be inspired by the story, I just felt like this is a modern film, it's a modern story, let's just lean into that modern gear. In that case, uh, we can walk through a couple of scenes. You ready to go through this? We're great. All right, let's do this. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, can you tell us what's happening in this scene? So this is Cecilia. Uh, waking up at the start of the film and well not waking up really she's been pretending she's asleep she's been waiting for this moment she had earlier drugged Adrian and she's been planning this escape from his house for weeks maybe months this sequence Lee and I talked about a lot because we wanted it to be incredibly suspenseful and we wanted it to feel like he could wake up at any moment we shot Adrian's house over three or four different locations so it was quite a jigsaw puzzle we shot extensive photo boards of this whole, you know, opening, 
I think, 10 minute sequence, just to be able to get the logistical puzzle right in our heads. This, for example, this bedroom with the ensuite and the wardrobe was all the dining room of one house in Sydney, Australia. The beautiful thing about this location is it had that amazing view of the ocean out the window. So every time we, you see that ocean out the window, we endeavoured to shoot that dusk for night so you could actually see the ocean out the window. It was a very, very short window to achieve that exposure that you're looking at right there. As I argued to everybody, what's the point of being here if we can't see that amazing view? That slash of light that you can see across the bed and across the floor there, that's a ARRI M90 HMI. Because the sun has set, you can actually feel that because it's overriding the ambient light. You know, I also had a bit of light coming from frame right from the bathroom there, a bit of warm light. Otherwise, it was more about trying to get that sweet dusk light and grading it down. Probably my actual exposure for this might have been, a, you know, a stop or two brighter, purely so I could have that detail to play with. And then we would have brought it down. As she's escaping the house in particular, can you talk a little bit about some of the lighting that went into these kinds of chase scenes? The forest when, she, when Elizabeth is running through there was as much torch driven as we could. Uh, we really wanted to feel like she was in the dark and the torch was mostly lighting her. But we also did have a Condor, I believe, with an ARRI Sky Panel 360 on it. And uh, that's what you can see in the background there, an ARRI 360 giving depth to those trees in the background. Also, we had a 360 and a soft box above Elizabeth for soft top light. We also had, um, you know, off camera uh, bounce board, might have been a bit of poly, that whenever Elizabeth flashed the torch past, it bounced a bit more light back at her. But also the camera is so sensitive that when Elizabeth flashed that torchlight on the ground, the dirt on the ground would bounce a lot of light back at Elizabeth. You know, I think I initially started doing that on torchlit scenes because I remember uh, on the commentary for Seven, uh, Darius Conji mentions that there's a particularly dark scene in that where he had bounce boards all in a location and he gave the directive to Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt to with their torches, if they want to be seen in the scene, hit the bounce boards. If they don't want to be seen in the scene, do not hit the bounce boards. And so he almost gave the the command for lighting off the cast. Like, when do you want to be lit and when do you not want to be lit? For a scene like this too, uh, one of the things I want to ask is kind of what, what is your philosophy on moonlight? Because that's something that I think is, is sort of confusing and hard for a lot of people to get. Everyone has a different idea on what movie dark is and what moonlight is. Directors are really sensitive to it as well in that on set, they might be feeling you're too bright, but often I'll expose it all up a little bit more, not knowing I just want an image with less noise in it, knowing that I'm gonna bring it down. I generally go for a steelier, cooler look, hopefully nothing too blue. Often when it's a full moon, I love to do photography of what a full moon actually looks like. It's actually really hard quality of light, and it's really bright. Like when you're in a rural area, you can see for miles, like it's so bright. If, if I were to light the way real moonlight looked, people would not buy it. So you ultimately kind of do your version of what you imagine moonlight is, which is often softer and cooler. Now, before we move on, I want to give a huge shout out to Artlist, who is actually there for us since the very beginning of our kickoff series. Now, we often use Artlist songs in basically all of our episodes because they're super easy to find. Great indie pop music that has a nice little beat drop to that title screen. And because Artlist keeps up with all the modern music trends, we know that pretty much any song they pick is going to go right into our edit. And we know that we also don't have to limit our usage just to YouTube either. In fact, Artlist has a worldwide royalty-free license program that covers everything from YouTube videos to podcasts to commercials to video games. So, yes, if we were to make a video game called Indie Mogul Attack of the Killer Gimbals, which you would probably see on Steam, you would probably hear music from Artlist.io. Let me tell you that Artlist is just $199 for an entire year, which comes out to something like $16 a month, which is a super small price to pay for unlimited downloads. So get started by using the link in the description down below, which will give you an additional two free months on top of that subscription. And thank you again to Artlist. Thank you for sponsoring this episode. Of course, back to the episode. So this is Cecilia going where no one ever should go in a movie, which is into an attic. Um, <laughs> and she's found Adrian's phone, which suggests that he's been up there. One of the directives Lee really wanted asked of me in this scene was he really wanted to, the attic to feel like it was being lit by the torch only, which I think 95% of this scene was really. I might have had little bounce boards throughout this that Elizabeth could have hit, which she was wonderfully helpful with. How did you set up the framing or decide where the camera was going to be for each of these shots? It was like, that is yeah. horrifying. 
we storyboarded um, pretty much this whole sequence from the attic onwards. Uh, so a lot of these ideas we'd talked about together with a storyboard artist and figured out early on. We knew when we were in the attic, we wanted to have a variety of angles throughout that to suggest that she could be being watched from any corner of that space. And I did most of that scene handheld with Elizabeth in that attic, which was really awkward to move around in and wondering because I'm quite tall and it was quite a realistic sized attic. You know, I probably put in a little bit of light in the background occasionally. We had, we cut some holes in the ceiling to be able to put some soft top light in when it needed just a little bit of more depth in the background so it didn't just fall off completely to black. So I built a soft box on the stage above this set. It might have been a, a 20 by 20 soft box. Again, it probably had a sky panel 360 in it through uh, grid cloth. And I knew that was there just in case we needed to open up more, more of the roof to be able to get some more depth because I was nervous about relying purely on a torch. I might have had some small cracks. Uh, or something. This is <laughs> this is this is Sorry. One thing that's really interesting to me is the cinematography of a jump scare. You know, what goes into the yeah. planning of something like that? Uh, well, well, Lee's done many of them, having done a lot of horror films. Um, so I really lean on him in that regards because this is a jump scare that the whole film's been leading up to in a way. It was ultimately just a locked off camera over Elizabeth's shoulder. Once that camera was locked off above her, we did multiple passes of this shot. So one pass would have been Elizabeth pouring paint over a man wearing a green screen suit with that texture. And then we would have done empty plates of this with nobody there. We would have done plates of just the paint being thrown. You know, we might've done three or four plates of just this shot. And then of course we've got this crazy fight scene. Where do we start with this kind of scene? <laughs> My question is how is probably a pretty fair question. You know, our stunt coordinator, our visual effects supervisor, our art department, everyone had many questions about how we were going to achieve this scene. One thing that was really important for Lee and I was for it to be a one-shot scene. We found it would be much more frightening if the camera would just hold in a very cold, clinical way, just following this violence. To achieve it, I knew that it was going to have to be motion control. What that gives us the ability to do is to do multiple plates of the same shot and layer that shot up. Lee really wanted a person in a suit fighting with Elizabeth on the day because he believed that would make her performance much better rather than Elizabeth just miming all this to nobody. We loved the way the motion control shot in a way that it was so artificial and clinical, the way it you know, rendered the movement in that I tried to shoot my dolly work the way a motion control camera would because it was kind of Fincher-esque in a way. You know, I know David Fincher uses a motion control camera a lot even for shots I've heard that don't need motion control because he loves the movement of it. So it ultimately became a dance uh, for Elizabeth because once our move was programmed, Elizabeth had to hit all of her marks perfectly because the camera was just going to perform that move again and again. And if she didn't keep in frame... The camera was moving on. To Elizabeth's credit, uh, she rehearsed it so well. We had a count on the day. So she knew when the count hit 20, she needed to be on the ground over there. When it hit 25, she needed to be here. And, you know, it was really exciting. So Cecilia is escaping a psychiatric ward now. Um, she's chasing the invisible man down as he's escaped through a car park in the rain. Again, we've got some very long steady cam shots here that ultimately were cut up a bit, but you know, we would do these very long takes on the day where Elizabeth and our wonderful Steadicam operator, Andrew Johnson, would be leading or following her throughout this space. We pre-visualized this whole scene in pre-production. I like to get out there early in pre-production and shoot stand-ins on a little camera, cut it together and figure out what the coverage is going to be. As rudimentary as it might look, it can give you a really good idea as to whether your coverage is working. Were there any things that you noticed in the previews that you were like, oh, maybe we need to add one or two things? Not particularly. I felt like what the previews 
gave us was the ability to have all those arguments and discussions before the night. Lee and I can put it on a computer. We can talk about what worked and what didn't work. The editor can be involved during production, which is fantastic. Talk to me a little bit about the lighting for the actual scene. We worked with the art department extensively to put in a lot of practical lighting at this location. So we put a lot of fluorescence on the building itself. We installed sodium vapor street lighting in our car park. So we had this sort of, you know, orange, greeny light that Elizabeth comes in and out of whenever possible or where I felt Elizabeth might have ventured into a darker area. I, I tried to hide sky panels uh, with a sodium vapor filter on to throw some more light in there, but it was really hard to hide anything in there because our camera was looking 270 degrees a lot of the time. But certainly for a lot of the long Steadicam stuff, you kind of just have to let her come in and out of darkness and live with a lot of it. You know, when we spin the whole unit around and shoot the other direction, I might drag those lights around a little bit so they're not as front lit. It's definitely trying to avoid front light in a situation like this. I'm trying to backlight the rain. I'm trying to light the architecture and the building more so than her. But again, it's a fine line. You know, this one shot in particular that we're looking at now, Lee and myself really wanted to be in silhouette. But for much of the moments after that, you kind of want to find that fine line where it feels moody and... Uh, dangerous, but you can always read her expression. And that when the when the rain comes on, that actually changes the ambience of the light to it. Everything gets a little bit brighter with the rain, I found, because it sort of catches the light. And you might have thought your backlight was looking kind of subtle, but once the rain comes up, it looks overcooked. For a movie like this, what's sort of like the biggest thing that you learned that, you know, for someone trying to approach a horror film or trying to shoot, what's sort of like the biggest tip? It, it kind of validated how important pre-production is on a film like this for me, because it's not a naturalistic drama where, you know, you might just be working with the actors on the day and figuring out the coverage on a naturalistic drama that would work. It doesn't mean coming into any of these days, you can't change the plan when you get there. It certainly makes me feel a lot more secure coming on to a difficult scene or a difficult day, knowing that we've spoken about it, we've got some solid ideas. If you see the actors do anything better, great. Well, there you have it, guys. There's your episode with Stefan Ducio on the cinematography of Invisible Man. Again, thank you to Artlist.io for sponsoring this video. Start by getting high-quality, independently produced music by going to the link in the description down below for an additional two free months of membership. Don't forget, we also have a podcast, too, as well, where we break into the film and we actually talk a little bit about how Stefan got into being a cinematographer and a little bit of the work that preceded Invisible Man. But uh, that is it for me, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And, of course, we'll catch you guys next time. Elizabeth Moss is such an incredible actress. She was able to sell so much of those, the suspense of those scenes by the most subtle of looks. You know, you do take one with her and you kind of look at each other like, well, what do we do now? Like, she's incredible.